Thank you for joining us. This is For Your Institution. Um, we are Mongoose. Uh, we uh, make a texting platform called Cadence and a chatbot called Harmony. And um, we uh, specialize in student engagement. But this particular forum, this For Your Institution forum is all about sharing ideas and uh, reaching solutions. And today it's going to be rethinking parent engagement. I'm Greg Bauck, the content um, production manager here at Mongoose. Mike Kaczynski, say hello to the folks. Hey everyone, Mike Kaczynski, client engagement manager. And uh, we have a very special guest uh, um, for this discussion today. Uh, Dave Becker, the CEO and co-founder of Campus ESP is joining us. Um, so Dave, uh, if you wouldn't mind um, saying hi to the folks and um, saying a little bit about uh, Campus ESP. Yeah, thanks, Greg. I'm excited to be here today. Uh, my name is Dave Becker. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Campus ESP. We work with about 200 schools um, helping with their parent engagement strategies. That could be engaging parents of prospective students or parents of current students. Usually it's focused around enrollment, sometimes around parent giving. Um, we like to say that we help nudge the nudgers. The parents are the ultimate nudgers. And uh, excited to give you some context about um, uh, some ideas possibly as well for, for what you, how you can engage with parents. Awesome. Awesome. Hey, they're um, your partners and um, what the ultimate goal is, and that is to help students. And uh, that's a shared goal between um, any department in higher ed. So anyone watching um, our presentation today, um, it's important to think about parents as your, um, your, your coworker, so to speak. So uh, what we want to start with, we're going to talk about um, parent engagement. And of course, we're going to talk a little bit about um, why that's important. But I think um, more important than that is um, coming up with solutions and sharing out there. So we're going to certainly um, talk a little bit about the why, but more so about the how. Um, this presentation is being recorded. I want to remind everyone, just in case you're joining us late um, or you have to skip off for some reason, you will get a recording of this presentation. So don't worry about that. Um, it is a community forum here at Mongoose. We'd like to make sure that um, we know every school has specific needs and um, differences. So make sure your school is represented. If you have a question, something comes up in the conversation, don't be afraid to um, either hit up the chat with a question, let Lexi know. If you'd like to come on and ask your question, you can do that. Lexi is going to be managing that conversation in the chat today. Um, also, if something comes up and you have a tip, something that's worked at your institution or best practices, please share that as well. We love sharing ideas here. That's a huge part of what we do here at For Your Institution. Um, so do that as well. So that's kind of the, um, the groundwork of what's going on here today. It's a community forum. Keep your cameras on. We love to see reactions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. It's being recorded. I think I've covered everything. Let's, talk about, let's talk about parent engagement. And I want to start uh, with Dave. Um, obviously, um, in your studies and in your uh, travels through life, um, I think it's no secret that parent engagement is more important than ever. I was hoping that maybe you can start by maybe talking a little bit about why that's the case. Um, well, there's, there's, <clears throat> let me start off with like, there's kind of like before COVID and then there's after COVID. <clears throat> and I think everybody can kind of get that reference there. Um, so before COVID, um, the rise of parent involvement, I really think is related to the cost of education. Like if you look at the cost of education, what's, um, you know, where a lot of the student debt's going, it is going on the backs of parents. So I would typically show charts that show the cost of education increasing. And then we had metrics that kind of tied it back to levels of parent involvement. So really from a financial perspective, parents are very involved in helping their students um, succeed. Sometimes we'd like to say that student success is family success, um, but it was still kind of like nebulous. Parent engagement, should you or should you not engage with parents? And then COVID hit, and then you throw in the whole health and safety thing as well, and plus access to information. And there's so much uncertainty. And then uh, I feel like since these last couple of years, I guess, yeah, it's been like a little over two years now, um, parent involvement is a very, very hot topic um, because parents are just more involved. They're probably calling um, your institution more, uh, reaching out. They have higher expectations. So it's just we've just seen an increase over the last couple of years. We had statistics. Um, we've referenced the study by Niche. We're going to put it up in the chat too. The um, results of the survey was really interesting. Um, the short and sweet of it, parent engagement is up five times uh, since before the pandemic started. 12% um, of parents saying that they did the college search primarily for their child, um, then together, and that 88% of parents um, were involved in the parent search and searching out um, their school. So um, statistics kind of to back up that why, um, that 
the parents are definitely more involved than they were before. Yeah, and I'll and I'll throw one else one another one out there. We work with um, Ruffalo and Levitz a bunch, and we just did a, a parent survey for parents of prospective students. These are the parents that have students that are coming into college in the next two or three years, and uh, each year. We measure, um, one of the questions we like to ask is, um, how often are you expecting communication from the schools your student is, is interested in? And uh, two years ago, two years ago, yeah, uh, 2020, it was, I believe, 64% expected weekly communication. Wow. Last year, last year it gets, it, gets, it gets better or worse, depending on what side <laughs> of it you're on. Last year, it, that number went from 64% up to 76%. And then this year, and we haven't even released it yet because we have a session coming up. I think it's actually next week. That same question, um, the parents responded, how often would you like to receive communication? They, uh, for, for the percentage that said at least once a week, 85%. So it went from 64 to 76 to 85%, which is crazy. Um, but they just have higher expectation levels and we're seeing an increase um, from the start of the pandemic forward. So that might highlight the importance of making sure that you're communicating with parents directly because the student might not want that much engagement. And if a parent wants more engagement, and obviously every case is going to be different, but um, setting that aside, we talked about getting contact info for parents early and how key that is in communicating with parents. So wherever you're meeting parents throughout the uh, funnel, um, throughout the process, and even if uh, a student is currently at your institution, um, getting their contact information as early as possible um, is super important in engagement. Yeah, I think um, most, well, I don't, most schools, uh, I think most schools engage with parents um, once the application is received from the student, but trying to get even earlier is useful from an enrollment, from a yield perspective. Certainly try collecting parent information on the RFI. My, I have, I'm of a twin 10th grade. So it's interesting um, being the uh, CEO and co-founder of Campus ESP, actually seeing what schools are doing and which schools are already reaching out to, to my students, but certainly trying to get parent information from the RFI forward, um, I think is the trend that we're seeing the most. But if you don't have it during the admission process, you can still get parent information for admitted students. And we see a lot of schools um, during the orientation process, pulling in parent information. There's a lot of reasons to engage with parents of current students as well. Um, Lexi put the, um, the, the niche survey we were referencing in the chat. Thanks for doing that, uh, Lexi. I have to ask you, Dave, do you want as a parent um, for your, uh, your twins to pick the same school so it's easier? No, 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 <laughs> no absolutely not. That's, that's, that's crazy, uh, no way. <laughs> you don't want them to pick the same school, that's interesting. I want them to pick the least expensive schools that meet their <laughs> needs um, and, and fulfill their happiness as, as possible. <laughs> Looking like a true parent, that's very good. So um, Mike, um, you're big on this and we like to talk about yeah. this all the time. So communicating with parents and talking about having a specific place for parents to go. And um, I, 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 I know you are very big on that. Right, so well, I guess taking a step back, Dave, where do parents typically find college information when they're doing their own research? I mean, I think it's from a variety of sources. Um, so even before we built Campus ESP or, or started engaging with parents, um, I basically did research for two years. There's an organization that, that focuses on parent um, communication and engagement called AHEPP, A-H-E-P-P-P. -P -P. And I went to a couple of those conferences and it's really interesting to just get statistics on like where parents are engaging, where are they coming from? I think a lot of them do go to niche and they go on the internet, obviously. Um, many of them go to College Confidential and other sources that might not have the most, you know, uh, uh, relevant information for them at the time. And then, of course, there's social media as well. But the social media stats are actually quite slanted if you actually look at the data of who's going into those social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram. Um, it's generally more affluent white families. And so when you're talking about parents of first generation students, um, you're talking about different races and ethnicities. It, like it's not one size fits all necessarily. Very interesting. I've been a big proponent that every college should have or university institution should have a mongoose IDDU slash parent guardian or guardians or whatever. Basically a website where you have 
notable programs. You talk about the campus, the community surrounding the campus, uh, probably bring up some notable alumni. You have all your um, notable dates throughout the year as well. Is that a good strategy? Should colleges kind of go above and beyond that? Um, it's a good intro strategy, um, certainly. I think you want to have the dates, deadlines, um, access to financial information. I, I think if you're looking for like one overarching concept, it's ROI. Parents want to know that there's ROI there. Um, they're not going to be necessarily as cynical as I am about like, hey, looking for the least expensive option. I think they just want to know that, you know, like I said before, student success is family success. They, they really, like, it's easy to say that the parents need to take a step back and the students need to struggle and potentially fail because that's what's best for them. But most parents don't go into it with that. They want to know they're going to look for the, the happy path, the success path. So I think, you know, when you first start engaging with parents, engaging with them in that manner, like, here's how we're going to help make your students successful. Here's how you can help or step away and set that appropriate level of engagement is also important. And then if you're ever thinking about just broadly, like what area to focus on, financial aid is always a good area to do a deep dive on. There are, there's just so much confusion out there um, with financial aid. And that's typically where we see the most clicks and engagement in our platform from a, um, from a parent engagement perspective. So talking about that, some of the numbers we have in the niche survey talks about how parents, um, they don't even know those resources are available which stresses the importance of making sure that any resources your school have are available. Um, what is the best way to do that um, in communication with parents? Is that just posted somewhere? Where have you found is uh, the best place to put that information to make sure that parents see it? Um, well, there's two things. Number one, it, it's kind of like you're trying to make a connection between the school and the parent, right? And on the school side, most of that information is probably on the website, but it's probably in the different silos that we know all exist, right? You know, all the different departments are trying to reach out to parents or at least know that parents are important. So for a parent going into the website and trying to navigate around can be very difficult and frustrating. And if they get frustrated, they're just gonna call you and then just gonna call to get the answer they think they need. So trying to create a single place for parents to go, it can just be like a, a website with basic information is a starting point. And then when you're thinking about the types of parents you're trying to reach, then you really have to get beyond the website. So I mentioned before how um, generally uh, white affluent parents are on social media. And if you look at the volume of communication on social media, you'll see that they're the ones who dominate the conversation. Um, uh, so if you're trying to reach those families, great, go there. Um, where we find a lot of parents wanting information is email is really important. And then increasingly um, text messaging is also important. Uh, we see um, parents year, year after year decreasing their preference of communication um, focused around phone calls. They wanna get more access to self-service information. So, so when you start thinking about the content that you have and the different ways to push it out, I'd say email is really important because when we, when we survey parents, we see that like generally 92, 90% of parents indicate at least some email sent their way. That might be like partially my generation's fault, Gen X, we love email. So I mean, you should definitely have the emails going out to them. And then what we also find is for text messages, um, increasingly that's parents of first generation students, it's black African-American families, it's Hispanic Latinx families. Um, those demographics increasingly every single year we see them wanting text messages as the main method of communication. So it really just depends on like what your enrollment strategy is and who you're trying to reach, but don't just assume because you have a Facebook group up there that it's gonna work. Yeah, and Facebook might even be, um, well, for reaching parents, that's still a very strong um, social site to use, but Facebook might be a little outdated for reaching parents or students at this point. Um, Mike, did you have anything to add to that before well, I did a little I homework? I had a question. When you're talking about ROI, when, when parents are considering the ROI of an institution, are they looking at from the, the, the larger institutional brand, or are they looking at individual programs or a combination? Like, what is that mix like? Um. <clears throat> It, it depends. I think there's, there's the larger well-known schools out there that probably don't have an enrollment issue right now, right? And what we find is parents get excited about being affiliated with that school. Um, one, of our, one of the recent stories I just told in, in our uh, company newsletter is um, 
the example of um, a parent I interviewed at um, University of Delaware. I don't know, by the way, I'm going to name schools here. Maybe that's bad. I, don't, I have no idea, but I'm going to just go for it. Um, and okay. and he, his, uh, yeah, I'm going there. Let's, let's, just, let's have some fun with this. So, um, so he graduated from Syracuse University. And it was really interesting talking about his experience as a parent. His daughter was at University of Delaware and she was graduating. And his, one of his concerns was, how am I going to stay connected with University of Delaware after she graduates? It kind of blew me away because I'm like, here's this guy who graduated from Syracuse. By the way, he's a partner at like a big four accounting firm. So if, you, if you're thinking that this is just one of those crazy parents, it's not. He has internships, wealth to provide, support to provide. And he wants to get connected with University of Delaware because he thinks by supporting University of Delaware, it's going to help his student. And he's probably, I forget where he was located, he's probably closer to University of Delaware as well. So there are that group of parents that really want to be connected with the brand. Um, and then there are um, parents that probably have students that are applying to more um, uh, enrollment um, focused, um, smaller private universities where they're like really looking for the educational experience and they wanna know more about the academic programs there. So I'd say it, it varies. Um, and I mean, the best thing to do, and this is going to seem like a, 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 a suggestion, which is just ask the parents, like, that's another big thing, which is if you try to get information from students, you may or may not be successful, but if you ask the parents, they will love filling out a survey. They will love telling you what other schools their student is looking at, where your school ranks in the order of um, preference. So I mean, a lot of times it's just moving on from the idea that parents shouldn't be involved and then thinking about, okay, look, these parents can be partners. Um, how do we leverage their involvement? And how do we get information that's actually going to help our institution? Very cool. Very cool. Um, just some housekeeping. I uh, want to thank you all for those just rolling in and still um, being admitted into the room. Um, Lexi, thanks for taking care of that. I uh, want to let you know if you're late that uh, this um, presentation is being recorded, so it'll be sent to you. So no worries if you were late, you didn't miss anything. Um, you'll have it in your inbox. Also, if you have questions, I appreciate everyone filling in in the chat with questions. Um, keep doing so as we are going to get to the Q&A um, and not too much further down the line here. Um, and also shout out to the schools that are making themselves known. We love mentioning schools, Dave. That's what we're all about. So San Antonio College is checked in. Simons Rock Early College is checked in. So love to see the um, schools representing here in the chat here on FYI as well. So um, some questions are coming in and we will indeed get to them. My personalization is huge, especially with parents. Absolutely. Talk a little bit about personalization in your communication with parents and how important that is. Are we talking for Mongoose or for Campus ESP? Well, I mean, Dave can probably cover Campus EXP. You can talk sure. about Mongoose if you'd like to. Sure. So, but just from a general standpoint to our audience who might yeah. not um, be familiar with either platform. We know on the Mongoose side of things when it comes to text, um, consistently personalized messages have a better response rate, um, significantly higher, about 50% higher. We know that um, the responses that individuals send back are typically less snarky, um, which is also good. But on what's top, a, what's a what's a snarky comment? Oh, geez. Um, uh, I don't go to this school. You would know that if you paid attention to the other. Yeah, yeah I was trying to think like of that. a Udell related one about you know like oh I went to Towson or something you know, uh, but I can't think of a good like I ninety five uh, joke <laughs> right now, but. Um, but yeah, so all sorts of stark responses can be avoided. But um, on top of all of that, when you when you personalize things, it, it again it demonstrates to uh, to parents or to students or whoever you, you happen to be texting that um, you know you're, this is actually human beings sending it. So it creates a better engagement experience than just you know blasting something off that says you know hey blue hens. Um, you know customizing it to the person is really important. Um, yes, without a doubt. I'd love if you covered um, your end of the spectrum on that question as well, Dave, from an ESP, a campus ESP perspective. Yeah, perspective. you know, it's, it's funny because we'll get schools that'll be like, well, if it's too personalized, it seems weird. And um, that's not really the problem that you should be solving. Like, like the, the problem is if like parents expect personalization, if you're not doing it, like, like they're almost, they almost get angry if they're like, well, this is, this doesn't even know me. And like, and I think most people are pretty savvy about like wanting to have newsletters or 
text messages or whatever the communication is be relevant to them. So, um, and, I, and by the way, I don't think it has to be through Campus ESP or Mongoose. You could do it through Constant Contact. You could do it through Slack. I mean, there's so many different tools out there. But if you're like, if you're going into it thinking, hey, this needs to be as generic as possible, I, I think you're missing the boat there. I think if you know that they're, that, that um, you know, it, this is a parent of a prospective student that has already visited campus, you don't have to encourage that parent to get their student to visit campus. You need to probably make sure um, the student's completing the application, not the parent completing the application, although we know they're all completing the application. So um, I think you can use that information um, and you know, parents generally expect it now, I would say. Um, great point brought up in the discussion uh, that mentioned, um, I'm trying to think of who said it, I rolled down there, uh, using the word guardian in, in you know, um, relation to this um, conversation as well. Of course, when we talk about parents, we're talking about parent guardians, and we often do um, use that term, just haven't used it in the last 10 minutes. Um, so um, a great reminder um, when you're communicating with parents to make sure that you're also um, inviting guardians into that, um, because it's, you know, uh, that's kind of part of personalization, just making sure that you're, um, you know, being inclusive to everyone that you're talking to. Um, yeah. Also, um, someone asked a question about the niche survey that we have in our chat. We referenced some statistics earlier. Um, I believe that survey was specific to um, prospective parent expectations. I know it's in the survey. There was a couple of ones that I was looking at, but I don't have it up in front of me right now. But the survey is in the chat. You can click on that. Lexi put it up for us. So um, just to answer that question and take care of that. Mike, did I cover personalization? Did you have something else on there? One other thing I just realized. I can too. tell. I yes. sense it. It's the heat coming <laughs> off of Mike. Radiant. When he has an idea, it gets brighter. So if you are texting too, one of the things to consider in 2022 is uh, carrier behavior too. And we know that carriers are much more likely to block messages that look spammy, look blasted out too. So personalization helps mitigate that as well. Um, Dave, just a quick, uh, sorry, ahead, just a quick note on the parents. What, what we typically find is most people use the term family. We hmm. family like it's the most inclusive. Um, I use family and parents interchangeably, but it's certainly supporters. Sometimes influencers sounds like too too um, um, too Instagram. Clinical. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's too too Instagram, not political. Um, but whatever, you, like I think family is what we find is the most um, common out there. So to be specific, if you're addressing someone in an email, would you say to the family of Smith, oh. or um, how would you do that? You can actually use their name. I mean, this is like one of the things we have on our website. Like moving on from to the parents of. Because we all know that's not personalized, right? Um, do you hope the email finds them well? Do you do that? Or? <laughs> yes, I hope this finds you well. Excl if you put an exclamation point in there, I believe. Oh, yeah. That. Then it's really well. <laughs> Got to drive it home. Uh, Dave, if you're not adverse to this, Mike, if you're not adverse to this, yes. I'd love to go to questions. Um, Lexi, who is going to be um, saying the questions, might be adverse to this. But I think we're ready. I think we're pretty well admitted. Lexi, are you out there in the um, FYI world? I am here in the FYI world. All right, we'd love it if you um, run down some questions and folks get them in the chat. And if you'd like to come on, just let Lexi know, but um, we'd love to answer some questions for you if possible. Yeah, so our first question today is from Vanessa. She's asking, is there a breakdown by cultural background, socioeconomic status of a percentage of parents who search for colleges and want communication? Um, following up to that is, would this data differ based on cultural backgrounds, socioeconomic backgrounds? Yeah. Why did so Dave talks? Uh, yeah, so I can, we used to do this funny, like, I thought it was funny, but it's not that funny, but I'll tell you the story of it, which is there, there was this Ruffalo and Levitt stat um, that said percentage of parents that were involved in the students um, college selection and it was 99% of parents. And we used to joke that like the other 1% hit the wrong button on the survey. Um, so they're, they're pretty much all involved to different levels, but I just think it's how you reach them. You know, um, so some people will be like, well, we don't wanna send out too many print materials, but the reality is, is parents are older and want the print materials and they're like, you know, going through the book. So um, it is, it really depends on who you're trying to reach, also where you're at geographically, um, you know, what your messages are. I do generally go back to, if you're looking for like one 
like some big trends to follow. We're definitely seeing, and I know because I'm, we're talking with, I'm talking with Mongoose folks here, but like it, it, we are definitely seeing a trend for more text messaging, um, especially from those segments of families that have students that, um, like I said, first generation, African-American, Hispanic, Latinx families, um, not as much white families on the text. It. We see more expectation. I know this also sounds self-serving around portals. Um, I just think it's, you know, what they're used to. So um, you need to look at who you're trying to attract and also from a perspective, who you're trying to retain um, and then just make sure you're, you're reaching them in the manner that's convenient to them. And also you can double up the communication too. If I may, please. Yeah. I always get in trouble for this. Everyone at Mongoose yells at me because we're, we do a texting platform. Um, uh, I, I, I'm always fascinated with print because when you get something in the mail that it, 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 things have changed so much that I almost feel like that can be um, kind of more impactful and not just for Gen X, I'm a Gen Xer myself, but um, how often do millennials or you know Gen Z get things in the mail? So um, I don't have any numbers behind it. I just think it's an interesting conversation on behavior and like how impactful, if you had a handwritten letter in the mail from someone, is there any chance you're not reading and really like sitting well with that handwritten letter? Obviously I'm not suggesting that our audience write a bunch of handwritten letters um, to prospective students or current students. That'd be kind of, kind of crazy, but I just think it's interesting. And I, um, I like getting in trouble and throwing that out there. Because... I ask about one? Oh, sure, go ahead. All right, so my alma mater, and I've heard other institutions do this as well, will have people on alumni boards in the faculty staff, maybe even uh, the executive unit of an institution up to the president, hand write letters to accepted students. Is that a worthwhile activity you think, Dave, in your mind? I, Mike, I don't know. I, we haven't asked that question. So I'm just gonna say, I do not know. Um, but I definitely, I, <laughs> which, uh, you know, um, but I will say that we do see um, parents of current students getting into the chat rooms of parents of admitted students. Mm -hmm. So parents influencing parents. And so there is kind of like a circle there. And then you get into like, well, who really owns the parent? Is it enrollment? Is it student affairs? Is it fundraising? So there's all these like really interesting issues out there for like how to engage with the parents. But those, it, those parents are just super influential, like maybe even more influential than alumni um, because, um, especially if like what you'll see, especially for people who are in social media and watching Facebook and stuff like that is for parents of current students, like if a, if a student has an issue, their parent might put it into social media and other parents will respond. It can go from anywhere from like, you know, I, my student needs a ride home to my student's sick to massive oversharing in social media. So, um, you know, these parents are influencing other parents. It's one of the reasons why I get like nervous about College Confidential and those other places, because a lot of the information really isn't, isn't the best advice. So if you can, if you can help guide those parents to the best sources of information, which might be your parents of current students, that is very influential. Dave, how would you identify, so you're Dave Becker University, right? You run your own institution. How do you identify the parents of current students who are most likely to be your best ambassadors? Oh, that is such a, I don't think I've ever been asked that, Mike. That is, um, Greg, is he really heating up there? Is the room getting hot? You've been, like Mike like <laughs> you've been Mike Ashinsky. That's what happened. Yeah, yes. Yeah. I have a um, sunburn. <laughs> I think so there, there are some schools and I don't know, maybe we do some sort of survey here. There are schools that have parent family relations offices. They actually are focused on parents. And when you have um, a real person who's in charge or at least partially in charge of connecting with parents, they have the best ability to like really understand who are your most active parents who wants to help. Whether that's in the enrollment process, the fundraising process, Generally, what happens is it happens during move-in. You know, you'll identify who are your most active parents. But um, before we built anything with Campus ESP, we, we did this thing called a parent engagement survey. We worked with about, I want to say, 14 institution um, 
surveyed 8,000 college parents. And then I also interviewed 30 parents and back to that University of Delaware story. That's where I got connected there. But um, each time I, I talked with somebody at the school who really understood parents. And if you were to ask them, hey, who are the eight parents that you know, our vice president of enrollment or the president needs to talk to because they can influence others, they're gonna have that list. They're gonna know right off the bat, they're gonna be like, this is my most active parent on social media or calling me up, we're showing up and saying, how can I help? And so it's probably not that hard to identify them as long as you have somebody whose job it is, uh, it doesn't have to be their full-time job, but it has to be at least partially a sign that they have parents engagement in their title. Yeah. Thank you. Is that um, helpful, hopefully? Extremely, yeah. yeah, that's good. Um, I didn't even understand the question. So uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. University of New Hampshire, Lindenwood University, Mayville State University, we love shout outs. Thanks for checking in. McLennan Community College in Waco, Texas, and hi yeah. from oh, yeah. Plymouth State University in New Hampshire. So just some shout outs there as we get Lexi ready to ask uh, another question um, from the chat. Lexi, let us have it. Yeah, here we go. Question number two comes from Kim. She says, our local university collects emails to send to parents. As far as I know, the community college that I work for does not. Is it standard for community colleges to collect parent emails? And then she also put FERPA in parentheses. Oh, well, community colleges. This is definitely one area where Typically, we find that collection of parent um, data is behind four-year institutions. So I don't really know why this is, um, but I mean, I think it's kind of crazy because so many um, community colleges have dual credit programs, any dual enrollment programs anyway. So you probably are collecting the parent information. I think it's more... Um, I don't know what it is. It, it's, it's kind of a mystery to us. We Of our 200 schools that we work with, only a small segment are community colleges. And I think it's a missed opportunity for community colleges, like I said, from the dual enrollment perspective, but going forward, also um, parents might wanna take additional classes as well. So I just think it's, it's uh, I'm a little bit, you can hear the frustration in my voice that like, I don't know why community colleges aren't jumping into it more. Um, please jump in if you're um, please jump in. into college and yeah, get us a, you know, we'd love to hear your perspective on this, of course, because I'm sure you're frustrated too, because your audience is um, much you know, wider than a four-year institution. So. But let's, but let's talk about FERPA for a second. So FERPA, um, it is the barrier that most non-believers in parent engagement throw at you, right? Um, and um, yeah, there are always concerns you have to have about FERPA. But FERPA is a law that was created like in the Lyndon Johnson era, all right? And as far as I know, and I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure I'm not, nobody's been sued because of FERPA yet. It's not like, it's not like ADA compliance or anything like that. Now, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be aware of FERPA. It just means you have to understand it. And generally what we find at schools is that there's, there's a lack of understanding, not only at the school, but within different departments. Um, and most schools, FERPA starts when the student actually shows up for class. That's not always the case. Texas, if we have Texas schools, I know Texas is a little bit different, but um, there's usually ways you can figure out FERPA. Um, one of the features we have in Campus ESP is a FERPA waiver, um, an electronic FERPA waiver, and most, and most schools will have some sort of like waiver process to get around FERPA. But remember, we're sharing student information with the parent. So if a parent volunteers information up front, that's really not impacting FERPA that much, but lots of confusion around FERPA. Well, and I would imagine for institutions, it's less about saying, you know, Jimmy and Jenny got A minuses in English 101 and more about, hey, me and Jenny's parents, guardians, just a reminder, grades are coming out in a week. So if you want to have those conversations around, you know, the holiday table before Christmas or holiday season, you know, just this is what's happening, right? Yeah, I mean, Mike, you're you're spot on. And um, you know, I mentioned I did the survey before we built anything with Campus ESP um, with this 8,000 college parents. And one of the questions we asked, it's one of my favorite questions. It's a very dark question. Is um, uh, to remember, this is the survey to parents. Um, do you have your students, I'm reading it over here on this other screen. Do you have your students' college IDs and passwords? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. I know. Deep, right? We had some really good questions on this. Can, can you expect honesty with that 
Well, okay, absolutely. You expect to be there to be some bias in the results, right? So the percentage of parents that admitted admitted it sixty one percent. That's shocking. Sixty one percent. And by the way, Mike, great reaction. Hopefully, we can we have this recording. We can run that back in slow mo with your actual reaction. Do a meme. So, so sixty sixty one percent, and that's just that that admitted it. Um, and um, so, so here's the here's the reality, which is if you don't figure out, or if you don't give parents a way to engage or tell them what is the appropriate way, they will create their own path. Enter helicopter, snowplow, uh, bulldozer, um, drone parents. Like I hear all of them, but the rea the reality is, is they are they are they have their students IDs and passwords. Just they, every single person on this call, I guarantee, over fifty percent of your students have given the IDs and passwords to the parents because it's not so much the parents. It, the students don't care. Number one, they don't care. And number two, if they do care, they feel like their parents can help them and they want the help. Now, here's where they want the help. They don't want the help on the grades. That was very that was spot on as well. They want help on the financial aspects of things. So um, when we look at... Um, the types of alerts that we send from campus ESP to parents about their student, if their student has approved the FERPA waiver process, we find that there's a positive impact on student retention if the parent is receiving alerts, not on grades, on financial aid information, holds, and enrollment status, like whether they went from full-time to part-time. Those three areas have an absolute impact <clears throat> on, on uh, student retention, we're just finalizing um, results from about uh, a dozen schools at campus CSP where we actually have data to show that. Um, and that'll come out, I believe, uh, next month, which is in a couple of days. So pretty soon. But um, absolutely, these parents help. Um, and I think it's, it's, a, it's a, a reality defining moment for a lot of us who just thought like too much parent involvement or any parent involvement would be bad. Like I'm Gen X. I didn't have any parent engagement when I went to, to school, but these students now, they really depend on their parents um, to help them. And I think with COVID, I'm sorry, I know I'm droning on here, but like my kids were not in school for 16 months. I'm in Philadelphia. They literally were not in school for 16 months. They are a year behind. There's no other way to put it, right? So when they struggle, when they go to one of your schools here, hopefully with a scholarship or some sort of financial aid, and they struggle, they're going to let, hopefully, my wife or, or me know, and we'll probably get engaged. And that's just probably the reality of where we're at culturally right now. My dad didn't even know my birthday. Um, oh, that's sad. No, it's okay. He had there's seven kids. Um, we, Greg, when when Mike reacted to the 61% that you said, my reaction was more thinking, I wish you could have surveyed the students to ask what percentage of them knew their ID and password <laughs> right. and whether or not it would be higher than the 61%, because if the parents, in some cases, as you said, are doing all the work, that number might even be lower. Um, they even saved in their browsers. Yeah, these kids with their dash lanes. Um, all right, so I don't know if we have questions, but I do know some people have been addressing some of the things we are saying. So I'm going to go back to Lexi um, just to clean up our chat box and make sure that we're addressing everyone um, who had tips or comments on what we were saying. Lexi, what do we got? Yes, we have a queue of questions, so no worries there. Mm. Our next one comes from Maria. She asks, what is the best practice to gather parents slash supporters info? When should this process start? Early. No, yeah. it's found on it. No, I mean, I agree. It's, I mean, I, so if you're in an enrollment office or admission office, I, you want to get it at the RFI stage if you can. Um, I think if you're... Um, if you're in the student affairs and it's like current families, and that's, that's your focus, then, I mean, you can get it from a variety of sources. It might be from your admission department. It might be from uh, FAFSA, people pull from the FAFSA as, as well, um, emergency contact information. Um, we have at Campus ESP an, an import process where you just load in parent names and um, the system will onboard um, parents, it'll you know say here's a welcome message. We want you to stay involved because here's all the reasons why you can help. And um, 
some schools get nervous about that. I was actually on a call with a school yesterday about like, well, we can't just put them in there. The unsubscribe rate is infinitesimally low. I mean, it is really, really low. Parents really want this information. And in, in a lot of cases, you can differentiate your effort, your, your enrollment efforts, your retention efforts by engaging with parents and families. Um, and yeah, so, so as early as possible. And also for, I don't know if there's any fundraising people here. I used to think like, don't nudge parents on fundraising until after their student graduates or close to graduation. That's also completely wrong. Um, you want to condition those parents for giving the moment their student enrolls. Um, and there's lots of different nuances to that. But the earlier that you build, pull them into the community, into the family, the more apt they are to help you um, later on. Dave, I had always, I work with a number of advancement clients at Mongoose. And the message I typically hear from the better fundraising institutions with parents is that they aim those efforts to emergency funds, to, uh, to food programs and food banks, things like that that are on campus that really impact the student experience, especially if students need something quickly. Do you find that that's true? Yeah, I mean, anytime you can attach stewardship to it or have a specific designation of where you want those funds to go, you're going you're gonna to see better results. But, Mike, as long, I mean, what we're seeing in campus ESP, and, and we actually, I, I think it's actually on Thursday, I'm giving a parent giving presentation. So if you're interested, you can go to the campusesp.com website and sign up for it. But we see um, um, parent giving that's 8x higher through campus ESP. It, some of it's campus ESP, but some of it's just, thinking strategically about how to engage with parents. But literally, two schools we work with, I know I'm going to keep on bringing up this name, University of Delaware and Catholic University of America, they saw amazing results through parent giving and also, maybe even more importantly, major gift identification. So um, it, it's, it's still tough, though, because not everybody recognizes or sees parents as an opportunity. Some, some of them see them as a problem, right? Um, but I think when you really look at the data, put your personal preferences of what you wish society did or didn't do aside, you see that like these, the students want to succeed. The schools want the students to succeed. The parents want the students to succeed. So why would you not align everybody and, and let them help you? They just want to help. Um, Lexi, thank you for putting um, Campus ESP's website in the chat in case anyone was interested in um, uh, visiting that and checking that out. Um, and we do love mentioning school names. University of Central Oklahoma checking in. Edmond, uh, Oklahoma? I've never heard of Edmond, Oklahoma. Mike probably knows uh, everything about Edmond. Um, Denise Dawkins from Dominican College in New York. Greetings from Colorado College. And I, what's that? The Tigers. The Tigers. That's an easy guess. Yes. Half of them are Tigers. Uh, Teal College in Greenville, PA. Gino Teal or Teal? Teal. Teal? They're the Tomcats. The Tom. Oh my goodness. Go. Uh, All day. I should just let Mike run this uh, FYI. He's, um, yeah, he's got it. Uh, all right. Let's go to another question, Lexi. Yeah. So Heather asked a follow up based off the last question you were answering. Where do you request parent information at? Is this an info sheet, application, et cetera? Um, kind of all of the above. I mean, um, definitely on the website. Um, I think more and more schools are doing that. It might be, um, you know, um, if, a, if a student is visiting campus, you want to get the parent information there. They're happy to give it generally um, I, as early as possible. And, you know, here's another um, interesting thing. It's like you can ask the students do you want your parents to receive information? And most parents, most students, not most students, but a, a good number of students will have their parents um, either forward it to their parents for the, for the parents to sign up or put in their parents' email address because the students worry that they're going to miss something. I mean, yeah. like, they're, so they almost, and again, right or wrong, this is what's happening, is the parents kind of keep them on track. I, I joked um, subtly before about, like, who's completing the applications, I think we all know there's a significant number of parents completing these applications. I can see some smiles out there. We know that's occurring. So, um, you know, you can either lean into that or you can ignore it, which is the worst thing, or you can try to stop it, which is just futile. So <laughs> I think just being authentic and being like, hey, if you're helping your students, you know, let's, let's make sure you have the right deadlines when you need them 
to apply for financial aid, get everything going on so that you don't miss anything and potentially end up in a difficult situation. Yeah. I mean, it's making your job easier. So why would you not embrace that? Right? Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Uh, Lexi, what do we got? Yeah, this question is from Marilyn. How much do you see content overlap for prospective students versus parents? Is it best to be answering unique questions for each audience or is there room for shared core content with just unique positioning in the email slash text? Mike made a noise, so I'm going to take a step this way and let him have at it. I would argue that your overarching marketing messages go to everybody, but you're going to tweak that slightly for different populations, different audiences. So when you talk about housing and you talk about, um, you know, the, the experience and, and what, you know, it's like to be in a quad or a triple or a double or single, um, and you talk about the room layouts, probably more students. When you talk about the deadlines, the cost, um, the difference in the, the actual location geography on campus, probably more the parents. But that overarching message is going to go to both. You're just going to tweak a couple things one way or another would be my estimation. What do you think, Dave? I agree with everything you're saying. And I'm going to add one wrinkle that people might forget about. Um, and this is like some of the secret sauce at Campus ESP, which is we manage content for all of our schools. And the people that are managing the content are interns, students. And they, the students know what parents need to know. So if you have um, student interns, like let them participate with engaging parents. Parents love when students write content. This is my experience. This is what um, XYZ school meant to me. Like that is really compelling content to the parents because then they start seeing their own child in that student. So, and, and you have, you know, no lack of students that are probably want to write that content and, you know, um, through college work study or what have you, you know, probably they're looking for not something to do, but like, just don't forget about that student content. It's very, very authentic and meaningful for parents. And two things on that, you said written, and I'm sure you know this, don't uh, also don't neglect a low budget video, um, just students talking on your website, parents would also like it in that form. It doesn't have to be a fancy production. Um, authenticity is key there. Also, because it kind of ties into addressing parents. Uh, Marilyn had a good point. Um, uh, just an interesting um, way that they uh, we talk about how to address parents, making sure you're using parents or guardians. They like to use, uh, Marilyn says, we like to use parents and supporters in their messaging. I thought that was nice. Um, a bit long in some context, but you know, keeps things inclusive and warm. So don't be too worried about uh, an extra long um, salutation. Um, uh, if you're being inclusive, I think people can read um, what they need to take out of that. So All right. um, do we wanna to go to another question with Lexi? We still have some time left on this. Dave, you're still doing good on time. Um, just making sure. Yep, I love it. Dave, More Dave, questions are better. All right, awesome. So let's go to another question if Lexi has one lined up for us. Yeah, of course. Um, the audience would love to hear some insights on favorite ways people secure parent needs. Are they mostly inbound traffic or are people reaching out through high schools or other forms? I don't have much on leads. I'm not sure. It's definitely not my area of expertise, but I would think more inbound. Parents I'm reaching out to schools in order to uh, find out about them. Know. You know, it, it, to me, it's like, and it's, it's, it's an advanced question because people have not figured it out yet. And you know, um, people haven't figured it out yet because there's not like a vendor that's selling you <laughs> barren, <laughs> barren names yet, right? Um, honestly, I think niche is kind of the closest to it. Um, niche has a lot of names. Um, I don't know, again, if I'm under sort of some sort of NDA with them, but like, I know they, they collect parent names and they're still figuring out what they want to do with them, you know, um, and how how you can access them. So if you work with niche, I'd probably ask them if they, you know, what you can do with them. Um, and then beyond that, I just haven't seen anybody else. I feel like EAB leans the most into like lead gen for parents, but I just haven't seen enough results yet to say, oh, this is who you should go to. But it's it's. It's going to be something that I think becomes a focus, especially because there's, you know, less and less testing data 
there's a demographic cliff. I don't need to go into the whole like, you know, scary story mode here, but I think more and more people are going to be focusing on parents and, and I don't know if it's been figured out yet, how to get, you know, parent leads yet. Okay. Well, you know, we do the best we can here. Not all the information is out there. It's a discussion. So certainly if you um, have something that on that, uh, don't be afraid to share it with us in the uh, chat as well. Lexi, uh, we're ready for the next question. If you are. Yeah, so this question is a three-parter. Um, if parents want weekly communication, how do you make sure that one, you're giving the proper necessary information, two, it's not overwhelming for them or their students, and three, do the seasons matter at all in these types of communications? Mike, take it away. <laughs> yeah, it feels like the scene in uh, Back to School, we're in danger field. <laughs> 27 <laughs> months. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so first the the content. So, uh, or sorry, first I think was the frequency. Correct. I'm looking for the question right now. I believe. Yeah, let's. It's probably easier is to read one? off the question. Is this the one? No, that's to do. Okay. Sorry about this. We're yeah, uh, we'll we're a small operation here. We're trying to find the question here. So. Uh, for dry erase board line. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Yeah. This one might have been emailed to us beforehand because I don't see it yeah, in the immediate chat. People do send their questions when they register. And Lexi, I just dropped it in the chat for you. I think it might have been a. It's a live yeah, broadcast, sure. folks. There's <laughs> proper yeah. necessary information. So, it's like being um, behind the curtain and in front of the curtain at the same time. There's <laughs> literally a curtain right here, too. Yes. So, yeah. That's great. <laughs> there. Um, okay. So, how do you ensure that you are giving the proper necessary information? So, um, I would argue survey for that. Uh, you would find out, you know, what parents want to know about. I would imagine working in higher education, talking to your students, talking to parents in the recruiting process that you get a pretty good sense of what are going to be on your uh, parents, guardian, supporters' minds. Um, the process does not get too overwhelming for them or their students. So setting expectations, yeah, I think, is a big part. Of yeah, this. and I would I would say again, like if you are Dave Becker University or Mike Kuczynski Tech, you know, make believe institution, you can set up anything you want. One of the things I would do is an orientation session with parents where you say, these are the expectations we have for communicating with you. We understand loco parentis. We understand that we have a role in molding your, your student and your student has some autonomy. We also understand that you may or may not be um, very influential in this process as well. So these are the parameters at our institution that we've set up. And uh, you know that's kind of how we do things at the school. So I mean, that's how I would do it for part two. And then part three, do the seasons matter? in communications, absolutely. Um, I think depending on where you are in a particular semester um, will absolutely dictate the content of that, um, that newsletter, that weekly communication. Um, the tenor of the, the conversation will be different too, depending on the time of year as well. Reginald points out too in the chat in terms of seasons, deadline reminders yes. are super important when communicating with parents. So I thought I'd slip that in because um, I appreciate Reginald um, putting that in the chat. Dave, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, the deadline's a great point there. Um, and I agree with everything Mike said, absolutely. Everyone um, always does. <laughs> um, it, it, we lost Dave for a second there. On this, setting up your content strategy um, by month. And I do think, like, to Mike's point, like, the seasonality does matter. And one of the things we're able to do it in Campus ESP is understand, like, how, what parents and what types of parents are clicking on content at different points in the year. So one of the, one of the studies we did, um, it's actually a couple of years ago now, is we looked at what parents of first-year students click on the first three months, right? And um, what we found is um, the top was, uh, I think it was like move-in information, as you might expect. Uh, number two was like parents weekend, like as soon as they're moving in, them in, they wanna know when they can come back. Um, then there is something, 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 something. The last, least most clicked content for parents of first year students was financial aid. And what's interesting about that is if you look at the rest of the year, financial aid is the most clicked on content. So, you know, that was, I mean, obvious, but also eye-opening at the same time when we're doing this, this study, which is, it has to be the right content at the right time. Um, and if you're looking for like a guidebook on that, like I said, there's some blogs on the Campus ESP website where it could, it'll, it'll tell you like what we generally 
figure out is our content calendar. And then, like I said earlier, you probably have most of this content on your website. It's just in different silos. And then, you know, how do you get it out to, to your parents through text, through email, carrier pigeon? I mean, it just it requires just somebody putting a little bit of thought to it. And, um, you know, you're probably going to see immediate results. Dave, you said something very interesting. You said types of parents. Do you create personas essentially for parents or how do you make those determinations? Yeah, so um, in Campus ESP, um, we have personas for first-year families, second-year families, third-year families. So what are, you, what are you trying to send to first-year families? It's around like letting go, critical thinking, encouraging independence, what are appropriate parent involvement expectations. Third-year parents might be more around um, career support, internships, um, plenty of examples of like trying to get more students to attend the career fair. You send a message to their parents Oh, yeah. And it's like overnight, amazing, like everything changes with your career. Like it, it, it's amazing. Um, so, so we look at that. We also look at parents of first generation students, whether they're receiving financial aid, um, in state, out of state, international, um, whether they're parents uh, who were, who used to attend, in other words, alumni parents. So you, you can really get into details there. I would say the most, the biggest segments are the enrollment stage of the student and then the year of the student. Like if you can focus on that, then I, I think that's a good starting point. And then I would definitely try to identify parents of first generation students because they have the highest levels of engagement and they need the most support because they're often the, time, the, the parents that if the student's struggling, they will tell the student, Let, well, let's give it a, a semester, come back, we'll figure it out later kind of thing. So they don't always know all the resources your school has, and they are very, very influential. Interesting. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Super good. I think we have time for one more question. Mike, did you? Did you didn't? Okay, so we have time for one more question, Lexi. Uh, um, do we have something on there? Um, this was asked early on, but we can probably circle back to it. It was talking about um, two different generations of college parents now, Gen X and Millennial. Maybe the increase in the number of wanting communications is due to the increase of Millennial parents. Well, as a Gen X parent, I just love to blame Millennial parents for everything. So I agree with that. <laughs> uh, I, I don't, you know, I don't know. I trust me on this like i when we first created campus esp we used to have this tagline i was very proud of myself it was we give helicopter parents a place to land and we would go to the conferences we'd have a picture of a helicopter and people would take pictures in front of it but it completely devalued what we were doing and who we were doing it for it's really there really aren't that many helicopter parents they're just on Facebook and making a lot of noise. The, most of the parents just want regular communication and they wanna know what they're supposed to know when they're supposed to know it. And if you can guide them to that, it doesn't really make a difference whether they're millennial or Gen X. They, they, I, I believe they want the same frequency, maybe through different modes. I'm like, I definitely love email. But, um, but it, it, I really go back to, I think it's the cost of education that, is, that have pulled parents into the process. Um, and it's just very different than when Gen X um, parents were in college. We just paid a lot less and the stakes didn't seem as high as they, as they do now. Um, so I don't know, that's my take on it. Mike, what do you think? Yeah. Absolutely. Hence the importance of stating ROI um, throughout the process um, to get yeah. parent retention, like make sure that they know that their investment is worthwhile. This has been awesome. Um, Dave, I can't thank you enough. Uh, CEO and co-founder of Campus ESP, um, you've been great. Thank you for, um, you know, joining us today and providing your insight. Lexi has the link to Campus ESP in our chat. Anything else you wanted to add or anything you wanted to plug or talk about uh, as we appreciate you being a guest today? No, I really enjoyed it. Always great to have a conversation. Mike and Greg, you guys are great. And I just know it's super hot in that room right now because like Mike that. is on fire. And uh, I just want to say I really enjoyed it. Thank you for having me on the episode. And uh, and you got a fan like this is 
Perfect. I'm going to turn this on in two minutes and I can't wait to do so. Yeah. Uh, thank you uh, to everyone out there who um, lent uh, their questions and uh, insight into the chat and shouted out your school. We love it. Make sure you join us again in two weeks for another conversation uh, on four-year institution. If you join us late, we are going to send you a recording. Don't worry about that. So you'll be getting that in your inbox. And um, everyone, Mike, thanks. Yeah, uh, of course. Yeah. Thanks for joining. Go Tomcats. Yes. Uh, yes. Go everyone. Go um, everyone. Yes. Thanks, everyone. Uh, and thanks, Flexi, for um, holding court and doing an excellent job as well. So um, thanks, everyone. And I hope you have a great day. Take care. Bye.